أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل عليه ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين لا سيما إمام زماننا هذا الحجة ابن الحسن صلوات الله وسلامه عليه الله صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Tonight is our third and final discussion on the coming of the Mahdi may Allah hasten his appearance and uh, as we all know that uh, tonight as well after Maghrib we mark the 15th night of Sha'ban uh, where we also commemorate the birth and the coming of the Imam of our time so inshallah what we would like to do is complete our topic that we have been discussing for the last uh, two nights and uh, thereafter inshallah we will talk about uh, the importance of this night as well as uh, um, specifically about the Imam uh, for the benefit of uh, the youth and the children as well um, up until yesterday we had begun discussing the reasons for which individuals might reject the Imam despite having waited for him all their lives and we gave a number of reasons and the third reason at which we stopped was that there will be individuals who will completely rely on physical signs and miracles to prove their uh, to prove uh, the Imam's uh, validity and that will be their um, uh, shortfall essentially and uh, one of uh, my dear brothers as well mentioned to me uh, last night that there is a khutbah or a sermon in Nahjul Balagha in which uh, Imam Ali salam discusses the very same Allahumma uh, salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad discusses the very same point about why um, Allah did not give his messengers all the miracles that people asked for uh, you will recall last night we mentioned that Surah Bani Israel chapter 17 verse 90 to 95 the mushrikeen or the polytheists of Mecca demanded from the Prophet that before we accept you you must show us all these signs you must bring a house of gold and you must show us an orchard of grapes and date palms and you must cause a river to gush beneath our feet and so on and so forth and you must ascend the heavens um, and uh, these uh, 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 signs Allah of course addresses them we said yesterday where Allah says that we have shown many signs to people in the past but they simply rejected it so we show miracles only as a deterrent only as an added proof only to prevent the evildoers uh, but it is not our intention to uh, use those primarily as proofs and Imam Ali alayhi salam in this sermon 192 which is known as Khutbatul Qasia um, he says uh, with a different reason he says had Allah wished he could have given all these signs to his prophets he could have given them the ability to create these houses of gold and ascend the heavens and so on and so forth but then it would negate the whole idea of being rewarded for good or being punished for evil in other words what the Imam is saying is even if it can be um, believed that physical signs would suffice as proofs assuming that the people of Musa and others denied but our generation would have accepted the signs it would still be a problem because those who are rewarded to a large extent are rewarded on the day of judgment for their belief in the unseen Allah of course does not have a physical form but if everyone could see the Malakut the kingdom of the heavens and could see the angels and if people could see paradise and hell 
And if people could see how every time they perform an action, good or evil, it manifests itself physically in form of a reward or punishment, then no one would perform anything evil. Everybody would strive to do good day and night because there would be a direct evidence and proof of their actions immediately. But a large degree of the reward on the Day of Judgment lies in the fact that you believe in the unseen. In fact, the Quran begins with that. Alif Lam Mim in Surah Al-Baqarah, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب. Those who believe in the unseen. It is part and parcel of having faith that you believe in the uh, unseen. And that's why you see the Quran uh, is revealed from Allah, but Allah is unseen. Uh, the angels are unseen. The paradise and hell are, is, is unseen. Uh, for most Muslims through the ages, they never saw the Prophet. So those are, that is unseen to them. And for our generation, the Imam is unseen as well. And the more one has believed based on reasoning and faith and not on uh, mushahada or witnessing with the eye, the greater the reward. Um, so Imam Ali alayhi salam says in that khutbah 192, that Allah could have also made his prophets such that they would have overcome their enemies with force. They would have some sort of superpowers by which they would cause anyone who stands in their way to be weakened and humbled and overcome. But that would also negate the idea of the world being a trial and a test and the whole idea of being rewarded and punished. So he said he made his messengers and prophets individuals of very strong determination but he made them physically appear to be weak. He made them physically appear to be human, flesh and blood, the kind that you could fight and overcome. And he kept their true uh, spiritual uh, ability or nur or power hidden and latent as opposed to uh, visible. So that uh, sort of is an added textual evidence or evidence from hadith that miracles alone will not suffice uh, and, and is not intended to be proof uh, for one who wants to verify anything. Now, we continue then from, uh, um, from yesterday's discussion on, on uh, this third reason, miracles, and we bring the fourth reason. The fourth reason is that some individuals who perhaps see themselves as being intellectuals, they will depend entirely on logic and intellect alone. And logic and intellect alone is also not sufficient um, to prove much. We know, for example, that our main concern and debate with atheists when it comes to proving the existence of God is precisely this, that the atheist wants to depend only on the mind to prove the existence of God. The mind, however, is not able, as we have said time and again, to know anything directly. The mind depends on the five senses. So the mind depends on what the eyes will transmit to it, or what the ears will transmit to it, or what the tongue will transmit to it, or what the nose will transmit, or what the skin, the sense of touch and sound and sight and so on and so forth. But the eyes itself, as a piece of jelly only, will only capture certain lights. There could be beings in this room who have a certain light or a frequency that the eye is not able to capture. And because the eye is not able to capture it, the mind cannot prove it. There may be sounds of certain frequencies that the human ear, the bones and whatever causes sound to travel through the ears, is not able to be captured by the human ear. Therefore, the mind has no experience of those sounds. That does not mean those frequencies do not exist. So, relying on simply logic and argument and intellectual proof can also be a hindrance to realizing who the Imam is. So there is a bit of both. There is the aspect of the miracles, not that the Imam will not perform miracle. There is the intellect that plays a role. Aql in itself has been acknowledged as a source of knowing God as well, as a hujja, as a proof, and therefore a source of knowing an Imam as well. But alone it will not suffice. And that is why you see philosophers after thousands of years they have still not concluded does God exist or not. They continue debating and arguing, and they never will conclude. And I don't think they intend to in any case. It's just uh, a going back and forth of uh, the mind producing proofs and counter proofs. So added to the complexity of relying on the intellect alone as being limited in the five senses, the media as well can steer individuals 
thoughts and intellects um, as we have seen time and again salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad muhammad we know these and people who have studied marketing and psychology they will tell you how um, the the ads you watch on tv and what you see on the newspapers and the billboards you see they're all targeted to cause you to think in a particular manner or to influence your values and your thoughts. So in similar vein, we have riwayat in a hadith to say that even after a voice is heard from the heavens announcing the coming of the Imam, there will be attempts to try and explain things away, as we have said in the past, either using quote-unquote science or using some form of media to say, well, this was not what you think, it was something else and so on and so forth. Or, for example, the whole issue of the Dukhan, the smoke that envelops the whole world. There is a whole surah of Quran, Surah to Dukhan, which talks about a sign that is to come um, as a warning to mankind. And uh, again, you will see when you read about that, that when it will come for a while, people will repent, turn towards Allah, but then again they will turn to sin because they will explain it away in some form or the other. And this is not something new. This has happened time and time again. Um, I remember recently seeing uh, um, an article by um, a scientist, if you like, trying to explain the parting of the sea for Musa a.s. And he was desperately trying to show that at the time that Musa went to the shores of the sea, right at that point there was a tsunami and the, you know, the waves and the earthquake and the whole thing split open and he just crossed in time and the, you know. So everybody will try and explain. I've seen articles as well by individuals who are opposed to Christianity saying that the miracle of Jesus walking on water was not really a great miracle because at the time that he was near the sea that he walked on, um, it was winter time and that particular year there was a lot of frost and there were some thin sheets of ice floating on the sea. So he was actually standing on a sheet of ice, he wasn't actually walking on water. So people will try and explain things away. Never mind the fact that why it would happen at exactly that time when a miracle is happening. Now if Allah causes certain natural phenomena and signs to come together in order for the miracle to manifest itself, that does not mean it is not from Allah. So if you can prove, for example, that the world came into existence with a big bang, that does not mean that Allah did not cause the big bang. So... Uh, Science and intellect can be proof, but is not necessarily conclusive proof. So this is another reason yet by which humans might reject um, the, the uh, coming of an imam. Now, we come to a fifth reason, which is um, a little more sensitive. And I um, um, urge us to listen to this and take it in the, with the intention that it was meant to be. And this is the matter of hypocrisy. A lot of times individuals may suffer from a form of hypocrisy without realizing that. And this comes from wanting peace and bliss and justice for oneself, but not necessarily for others. And often the question is asked, how do we come closer to our imam? Or how do we build a relationship with our imam? Or how do we get to know the imam better? Or how do we personalize that relationship with him? And this can be answered in many ways, but one way is in aligning our values and our character to his, not waiting that when he comes and establishes a system of justice, then we will live by justice. We need to learn to say that what will the world look like when he comes? Can I start living like that to the degree that I can? Right? There may be things that are beyond our ability, but there may be things that are within our ability. As an example, Time and again I have heard individuals from the Muslim community, unfortunately, who will boast of how well they have done in business and how they sold things at 200% profit or 300% profit or 500% profit. And there is a need to ask ourselves, are these the values by which the Imam lives by? If these are the things that we take pride in, that I got this for $50 but I was able to sell it for $300, are we going to be able to live in a system where this is not permitted? And what would our reaction be if we were taken to task or punished for having done such a thing? You see, so we want justice and good and wealth and bliss and comfort for ourselves, but sometimes we neglect that 
aspect that we're not able to live in a society where justice has to prevail for everyone. This may be also in other forms. You may have been to places and countries where you will find Muslims cheating others. Uh, not necessarily Muslims only, it happens all over the world, but our concern is primarily first as Muslims because it should not be expected of a Muslim. It could be understood of someone who does not believe in God, but certainly not of a Muslim. So you may come across societies, not necessarily here, where individuals who call themselves Muslims show a lack of integrity. They might overcharge you when they give you a ride in the taxi. They might overcharge you because you don't know the language or because you don't speak that language or they know you're a tourist, for example. Now, such individuals, they also pray, Allahumma ajjil farajahu, oh Allah, hasten the appearance of the Imam. They celebrate the 15th of Sha'ban. But will they be able to survive in a system where they cannot cheat people? See, so these are things that uh, um, need to be thought about, that we don't change to a new leaf and develop 100% integrity overnight when the Imam comes. It is something we have or we don't have. As we have said before, we cannot have 99% integrity or 99.9% .9 integrity. We either have it or we don't. And if we cannot be just today with ourselves, with our families, with our community, and if we continue fighting, arguing over little things, petty things, holding grudges, not, wish, not being willing to forgive each other for mistakes that we ourselves have made in the past, then we should at least, at the very least, acknowledge that we would not be able to live very easily in a society where there is no room for individuals um, who behave like that. Then there may be things, as I said, petty things, backbiting, speaking ill of each other, and so on and so forth. There may be things that are around us in society that we are used to, but in our hearts we should be averse to them. We should not be acknowledging them and accepting them. For example, there is the system of interest. Now, I do not wish to discuss the fiqh laws and masail of taking interest and so on and the banking system and what the ulama have to say and so on and so forth. But overall, we know that the system of, in, of interest is one that is meant to enslave people and to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Now, we may have to live with that sort of a system under certain circumstances, and we might even have certain allowances from the maraje in the present time we live in. But that does not mean that in our hearts we love that system. Because when the imam comes, that system will be abolished for sure. So now, can we live in a society where we earn a living, but we don't earn interest? For many, this would be very hard to accept. It may be easy to speak about it. But this is what I mean. There is pros and cons to living in a society that is not primarily a Muslim society. The advantages of living in a society such as ours in the West is that you are able to clearly see religion from culture if you choose to do so. Many individuals who come from the East or who live in societies that are predominantly Muslim, when you visit them, when you talk to them, when you see how they live, you find that they have confused culture and Islam. And a lot of times they're not able to distinguish one from the other. Nor do they take religion as something precious. They take it for granted because it is all around. They do not, for example, take a lot of pain to raise their children with Islamic teachings or bring them to the madrasa because if I don't raise my child, my neighbor will raise my child. Mahalla is there, there's somebody other, there's a mosque in every corner, the child will grow up as a good Muslim. A lot of times these individuals when they come here, they are overwhelmed and they stop praying, they stop fasting and so on and so forth. We've all heard of such uh, horror stories. But the disadvantage of living in a society that is not predominantly Muslim as well, is that you grow up seeing things that desensitize us so that we no longer see what is wrong as wrong. For example, if from the time I was born, Everywhere I grew, I saw every corner there was a beer store, just as an example. I am desensitized to the idea that alcohol is bad. I may not drink or consume alcohol as a Muslim, but nonetheless, it is something that I do not feel repulsed by, because I'm used to seeing that. Right? All the time on the televisions, the advertisements at the grocery stores, where they may sell it, and so on and so forth. So then when the Imam comes, these things are eliminated. Not that we would miss them, but this is just one example amongst many. 
Or for example, the fact that you grow up in a society where predominantly when you walk around in society, you don't see hijab being observed, because the majority are not Muslims. Now you live in a society where predominantly everyone is in hijab. That might be, so to speak, a cultural shock to many individuals. And so, living in an Islamic society is a little different, uh, and we need to love Islam and what it stands for, and understand the philosophy behind its values in order to accept living in such a society. For example, in a true Islamic society with the Imam uh, uh, in, in, in control of the, the global Muslim society, there may be a system where everywhere there is congregational prayers being held, there is Friday prayers being held. Now we need and we have to attend those Friday prayers. Even the individuals who say Jum'ah prayers is not wajib, they say it's wajib in the presence of the Imam. But if all our lives we are against praying Jamaat prayers, we are against praying Friday prayers, then how would we adjust in such a society? If we cannot look beyond fighting and arguing over little things like, you know, is this music allowed or is that music not allowed? Can I eat from here? Can I not eat from there? Why is hijab wajib? Why is it not? Then it would certainly be very difficult for us to exist in a society where not only Islamic values are upheld but enforced, where the system in the court of reward and punishment of justice is the Islamic hudud. You see, when the, it comes to the same issue of living in a society where the society drums into us certain ideas that these are old-fashioned and barbaric. Islam has its own philosophy, for example, where it upholds capital punishment or death sentence for certain sins and crimes, such as, for example, adultery or murder. Now, we live in a society where there is no capital punishment. If we suddenly had to live in a society where this is enforced, there are many individuals who all their lives prayed for the Imam without thinking of these things because subliminally they always believed that these were barbaric and these were things that were not acceptable, that this was old, that this had to change. The Imam cannot change the Sharia of Muhammad because the halal of Muhammad remains halal ila yawmil qiyamah and the haram of Muhammad remains haram ila yawmil qiyamah. Salat ala Muhammad. So today we have some leeway where I can sit with you and argue, well, your mujtahid says this, but my mujtahid says that. But when there is only one imam, the opinion will be only one. Therefore, everybody will do only that which he says. So it is not that the imam wishes to enforce in the sense of a military regime or an oppressive regime. It is an Imam who is Ra'uf and Rahim, who is kind and compassionate, who loves humanity and the creatures of God. He is an Imam who is groomed to establish peace and justice on the earth. But we in turn must understand those values. We must take the time to study them and understand the philosophy behind them. In other words, we need to go from a position of simply following Sharia out of a sense of guilt or enforced or fear of hell to a point where we love Islam where we cannot wait for him to come so that we can live in a society where true Islamic values are held. And that needs a certain change in thinking for some, not necessarily for all of us, but certainly for individuals like myself. So, if we continue striving then for purity, for spirituality, for a higher understanding of Islam, then obviously we have nothing to fear. But if... Um, we are averse to certain things, then obviously we, uh, we at least, at the very least, need to ask ourselves, am I being hypocritical by praying for the return of the Imam when I'm not ready for him? Right? Because many of us, we still love our materialistic lives and societies. I cannot list how many people I've heard praising a society that is un-Islamic over an Islamic society only because of their material benefit. For example, they would tell me things like, well, this is not a Muslim society, but at least I get free meds, or at least I'm looked after when I grow old and I'm a senior, or at least this happens or that happens, or at least I have an OHIP card and I can get my surgery done for free. What does the Muslims do? If I went and lived in my back home, wherever it is, that Muslim country, they would not look after me. And they would... So it's all what is in it for me from a material perspective that I get support, financial support, or health care, or so on and so forth. But if I look beyond that and say, on what basis and principle does this society survive? 
What are the values it upholds? What are its foreign policies? How does it view Muslims? What states and regimes does it support that are oppressive and unjust to fellow Muslims? Does it uphold immorality? Does it deny the existence of God? Is it an individualistic, godless society? Are things like alcohol and adultery and so on and homosexuality and all these things freely accepted as being normal? If the society itself is rotting at the foundation and its values and principles are wrong, yet I admire it and I love it and I prefer it over other places, not to say that the other Muslim countries are good, they may have their own issues. They may be dictatorial, they may be monarchies, they may be unjust, they may have their own problems. But that does not mean that I love a society that is based on un-Islamic principles and values. Because then what I am saying is that the Sharia and the laws and the values of the Qur'an are simply historic ideas that were meant for past generations. They are no longer applicable in today's society. But when I firmly believe that no, what the Qur'an holds is right and that is equity and justice for mankind. And I cannot wait for an Imam who will establish a system where these values are upheld. And I will live by those principles and make sacrifices to make that a reality. It is then and only then that I have a right to say that I pray sincerely and say Allahumma ajjil farajahu without any hypocrisy in me. So we really, really need to look inwards and ask ourselves, why am I praying for him to return? Is it because I'm fed up? Is it because I hate the enemies? I hate the West or I hate the Zionists or I hate this and that? Or is it because I really want to see Islamic values shared with humanity and a world that exists on these Islamic principles? So... Without laboring this point, then this would be the fifth reason why individuals might reject the Imam on his uh, return. A sixth reason, and again this is also a little sensitive and again I urge you to take it in the uh, understanding and stride that it is meant to be, because when I speak, given the fact that many of these lectures and majlises are not limited to just one audience, but they tend to somehow make their way on the internet and they are heard by individuals even outside this continent or outside what we call the Western world. So understand that in a broader context. The sixth reason is that there tends to be a reliance on traditions and ahadith and riwayats without accepting that some of them may not be reliable. And I understand very well the sensitivity of this. But many a times when we are inflexible and we are driven with pride, or with jealousy, or with affiliation with one group over the other. We tend to listen to who is saying what, rather than what is being said. Or we assume that if it is in a book of hadith, therefore it is true, without giving it much thought. And Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, the narrators of hadith are many, but the preservers of hadith are few. There are many, many people who can just read hadith for you again and again from lots and lots of sources. But individuals who have the ability or who will take the time to look at that hadith and then look at it in the light of the Qur'an and then make sure what implications this has on the minds of the audience and how this works in society and whether this is agreeable first to his conscious and uh, understanding and then also on the authenticity of those traditions. Those would be fewer. As an example, now, the point that I wish to make here is one of being rigid and proud and refusing to accept that some of the traditions or ahadith that we read about the coming of the Imam may or may not be true. That is the point I'm trying to make, not a specific example that I'm about to give. I'm going to give you an example, but I cannot stress enough that I am not saying that this is not true. This may very well be true, but it is an example. And it is something that I have heard myself from a scholar um, in the Middle East. This scholar narrates a tradition. He says, when the Mahdi alayhi salam returns, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, his light and his nur will radiate with such brilliance that it will replace the sun and the sun will no longer be needed and it will become useless. 
And the humans of this world will then rely on the light and the nur of the imam for their existence rather than the sun. Okay. And this scholar who is respected by many went on to um, argue and prove this through different ways. For example, he took the verse of the Quran that says, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْعَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا That the earth shall be lit and will light with the light of its Lord. And then he discussed the word Rabb to say that Rabb does not always mean God. Rabb means one who sustains or one who looks after or a Lord even in the general sense as the Lord of the house. For example, a homemaker or a housewife is sometimes in Arabic called Rabbatul Bayt. So in that sense he said that the Rabb that is mentioned is the Mahdi. That the earth shall shine with the nur of its Rabb. Okay. Now, we don't know whether this tradition has been verified or not, and he may very well have verified it, and it may very well be true. As I said, I am not challenging that hadith. But it then raises other questions that sometimes we are not able to answer. For example, someone who heard this tradition then had questions for me. He said, wasn't the Prophet greater than the Imam? Why didn't the light of the Prophet outshine the sun? So we say, well, maybe Allah hid the nur of the Prophet to protect him from the enemies. He said, well, isn't the Imam on the earth today? If he is, then why does his light not outshine the sun today? Then you may argue again and say, well, Allah is hiding his light right now to preserve and protect him from the enemies, but when he returns, his light will manifest. So then he asks me, well, then when it is night time, the sun sets and we are able to sleep, but if the Imam is present, then the light will always be present. Does it mean his light will go away in the night? So you see the questions keep coming and at some point you are clutching at straws to explain it. This does not mean that the tradition is false. It may actually be true but might have a meaning that is beyond my understanding. It may have a meaning that is symbolic for example. But the point I'm trying to make and again I want to stress this is not this particular hadith. The point I'm trying to make is that there are individuals who will take a tradition and they will hold on to it with absolute inflexibility and rigidity and say, this has to happen. If this does not happen, I will not accept this individual as the Imam. Whereas we need to be aware and cognizant of the fact that with hadith, there may be a hadith that were forged, there may be a hadith that are true, but when they manifest themselves, they will show themselves in a different manner, not in the manner we expect it to. As an example, I mentioned last year that one of the signs we are given is that uh, for the coming of the, of the Imam salam, is that the sun will rise from the west. And we gave an example. We said it does not necessarily mean that the world will stay the way it is and the sun will now start rising from the west. Scientists talk all the time of the melting of ice on the North Pole and they talk of as the ice melts, there could be a tilting of the earth on its axis and there could be what they call a polar shift. And if a polar shift was to happen and the earth was to rotate completely, they say there would be a lot of catastrophe, there would be all kinds of landslides, there would be water covering where there is land, there would be new land resurfacing from the ocean, which might explain the one third of the population dying that we talked about yesterday. But if the earth was to rotate on its axis and the north pole was to be the south and the south was to be the north, then the sun would still rise as it does today, but now your east becomes your west and your west becomes your east. So your understanding of the sun rising from the west might not necessarily happen exactly the way you want it to happen. And this is very important to remember. So along all these discussions that we have been having from the very first night, the point we have tried to stress is that the coming of the Imam will require human beings to be compassionate, to be understanding, but to expect things to happen through sacrifices and through ordinary means. There may be signs that will happen, but we must not be fixed and rigid to say it must be this way or that way. We must be open to the idea that things might happen different from how we expect it. And indeed they will happen, because in that lies a trial. Otherwise there wouldn't be a trial, would there? It would have been very easy then to decide on uh, what is haq and what is batil. Now I give you an example from history, from the Muslim history, that will make it a little easier to understand. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Consider for example, the history of the Jews and the Christians in the Middle East. 
When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to the, Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad When he declared himself as the Prophet of Allah in Mecca there were a lot of Jews living in Medina which at the time was called Yathrib and there were a lot of Christians living in an area that is called Najran a group of whom had come for which the incident of Mubahala took place when you read the books of history to say how did the Jews and the Christian end up in the Middle East it is interesting to note that they came there because they had read in their books prophecies that a prophet would come from the Middle East which means the Jews primarily came to Medina waiting for the Prophet. This was why they were there. And the Mushrikeen in Mecca, the polytheists, were not waiting for him because they didn't have a scripture. They didn't have Torah or Injil. The irony of the whole thing is that when this Prophet rose and declared his mission, who were the people who accepted him and who were the ones who opposed him the most? Initially, Yes, he faced a lot of resistance from the Quraysh and he had to migrate to Medina. But even in Medina, the people who accepted him were the Mushrikeen, were the polytheists, were the ones who worshipped idols. And then Mecca. The Jews who had been waiting for him all their lives, they are the ones who opposed him. They are the ones who fought him at Khaybar and Khandak and so on. There were some who changed and accepted him. But despite the proofs he gave them, if you read the Quran, the lame excuses and arguments they gave are listed in the book. Which is very, very ironic, isn't it? And we seek refuge with Allah from such an incident taking place with the Muslim community, where large numbers of us wait for the Imam, and large numbers of non-Muslims are oblivious to him. But when he establishes a world based on justice, then a large number of those who do not know him today accept him in droves. And those who claim to follow him deny him. History repeats itself, isn't it? So we need to ask ourselves what went wrong there and why would it not go uh, right with us? It is very, very important that we look at this. And this is not something that I am supposing or imagining. But we have this from a hadith. A hadith, one tradition that I read just today, which said that when the Mahdi salam returns, a large number of those who claim to follow him will deny him. And there will be people who worship the sun and the moon who will accept his message. So this is something that is there in the books, and it is something that we need to be uh, cautious about. Now a final point that I wish to discuss uh, before we wrap up this three-day discussion is a lack of purity of the heart, which is the major reason for which people would deny the Imam. And this reason is actually the reason for all the other previous reasons that we have discussed. That that reliance on miracles, or that not being willing to sacrifice, or that idea of only expecting proof through the intellect, or that hypocrisy, or that uh, uh, being rigid in our belief, or pride, or jealousy, or whatever it may be, its source and its root is that lack of purity of the heart. And the opposite is also true, that those who would be most readily willing to accept the message of the Imam would be those who are purest of heart. Which therefore then leads us to conclude that the best way to identify the Imam is not through the signs and the miracles, nor through the intellectual proofs as much as through the purity of the heart. Because the heart will always, when purified, it will always testify to that which is just and true. It will always deny that which is false. The others will also play a role, knowing the signs are important. The miracles, the signs, that the, the, the things that are in the possessions of the Imam that he will produce, the Dhulfiqar of his forefathers, the Aba, the turban, all those signs that we have in books are, have their place. But it is the purity of the heart, we shall conclude, that will be the deciding factor on who accepts and who denies uh, um, the Imam. And this is true for all matters. We said yesterday when discussing the ayah, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا That whether we seek to accept God, the Qur'an itself says that it guides some and it misguides some. يَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا And we have discussed this ayah again in the past. 
that whether we wish to verify is the Qur'an the word of God, or whether we wish to prove the existence of God, or whether we need to understand the reality and the truth of Ali Muhammad, or whether we want to identify whether the individual in front of me is the Imam or not, the most striking proof and the greatest evidence will come from the purity of my heart. If you look at the Messenger of Allah again as an example, peace be on him and his family, when he came and began preaching his mission, he did show signs to the Quraysh. One of his most astounding signs was the splitting of the moon that the Qur'an testifies to. He showed them signs like taking pebbles in his hand and the pebbles would glorify Allah. Imam Ali in Nahjul Balagha talks of a miracle where he says that the Prophet summoned a tree and the tree came out and it walked towards him on its roots. So miracles like these were shown but they still denied the proof. Now, look at the arguments that those who denied him gave. It is typically the kind of arguments that you will find in a petty society. They gave arguments like, look at this man, he's dividing our community. He's causing fathers and sons to fight. He's calling mothers and daughters to fight amongst themselves. He's confusing the youths. This was the arguments. Do you not see that in our society sometimes? The very same arguments will be brought forth. That this person is confusing. The idea is, is what is being said truth or not, or falsehood? Not the fact that we want to hold on to what we have seen from our forefathers. And then look at the people who accepted the message. The first ones to accept the message of Islam were the poor, were the downtrodden, were the oppressed, were the slaves. And what was their argument and reason for believing? It wasn't the fact that we saw him splitting the moon. It was the fact that this man tells us not to bury our daughters alive. It was the fact that this man tells us that women are human beings. They are not to be treated subhuman. In other words, they saw that he stood for truth, he stood for justice, he stood for human rights. He stood for that which was fair and equity for all human beings. And they were attracted to it foremost because they were oppressed and they were victims of those circumstances. That he was against materialism, that he was against idol worship, that he was against that which demeans a human being. So on the same basis, if we purify our hearts, then when the Imam comes forth, because we know from the books of Ahadith that they will come forth at least 60 liars claiming to be the Mahdi before the Imam. So there is no shortage of false Mahdis. In identifying the right one, we will know the right one because of the fact that he will not ask for people to worship him. He will not ask to control people. He will not want political power for the sake of it. It will not be a movement based on capitalism or materialism. It will be one that will speak for the oppressed. It will, it will be one that will speak against oppression and against injustices. So this purity of heart is very, very important in making us understand uh, the reality and the truth of the Imam. If we can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now in the uh, time that I have left uh, for tonight, as uh, we have said tonight, is a very, very special night. Uh, as far as our three-day discussion is concerned, um, this would be a conclusion to it. We have discussed the signs of the Imam and the sequence in which they uh, would occur. And we have listed various signs for which people might reject the Imam. And I think that is enough food for thought for us to go back and on a night such as this to think and ask ourselves, uh, are there signs here that I can relate to myself and are there areas that I need to work on to find sincerity and purity in myself and say, am I ready for the Imam? Um, I have some other interesting ahadith related to the Imam, uh, some partly talking of the signs of his return, some partly talking of his Shias and talking of uh, the condition of the people at the time and how difficult it would be to hold on to true faith. I will share these with you if time permits. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just so that we do not uh, run out of time without having discussed the importance of the 15th night of Shaban, I wish to uh, switch to that and talk first about the importance of tonight. And then inshallah, if time permits, we will come back and talk about some of the ahadith related to our Imam, if we can recite aloud, Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
This night uh, that will come upon us uh, at Maghrib is also known as the night of Bara'a. And uh, Bara'a is to disassociate or to free oneself from something. And so for, therefore, we are told from the ahadith and riwayat that it is a night to free ourselves from sins. It is a night to purify ourselves. We know from uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad that he reports from his father Imam Muhammad al-Baqir sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad that besides the night of Qadr which takes place in the month of Ramadan there is no greater night in Islam uh, besides uh, this night. So after the night of Qadr, this night that we shall have the fortune inshallah of witnessing and, and, and worshipping Allah in is the second greatest night uh, for us. It is a night in which Allah promises forgiveness to anyone who is willing to sincerely repent. Anything one asks from Allah, if it is not sinful and not evil for him and not bad in his interest, Allah will grant it on this night, insha'Allah. It is a night in which a person's destiny is also decreed in matters of uh, the life that one has, who will live another year and who will die within the next year. That is also decreed on this night. Misfortunes and bala, epidemics, illnesses, all these are also written for people it may not be punishment, it may be trials for people and tests for people, but they are decreed on this night. And hence you see that the Yaseen we recite and the du'as that we seek refuge with Allah from min ta'uni wal waba wa mawtil fuj'a and sudden death and so on, they are in line with this. Those who shall be blessed with pilgrimage to Mecca is also decreed on this night. So for those who have a true longing and yearning for this, this is an excellent night to pray for. Now we also know that these things are decreed on the night of Qadr. So many people will often ask, is there a contradiction here? On what night exactly is this being decreed? And there are two understandings of this. One understanding is that some matters are decreed on this night and others on the night of Qadr. There is another understanding which perhaps is more uh, favorable uh, or favored, and that is that the initial decree is done tonight, but it is written as a matter that will not change, as something that is amrun mahtum on the night of Qadr. So that Allah gives us a time uh, between this night and the night of Qadr to continue praying to Him and pleading to Him to give us the good if it wasn't in our destiny and to remove that which might be harmful or disliked by us if it has been decreed for us. Sheikh Abbas Qummi also writes in Mafatir al-Jinan that it is also the night, the milad of Sultan al-Asr wa Imam al-Zaman al-Hujjat ibn al-Hassan arwahuna lahu al-Fida salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and therefore there may be good reason that Allah chooses a night like this which is the second greatest night in Islam for the birth of his final proof and so it is a very special night as well and uh, we have riwayat that recommend us to stay up all night in worship for those who are able to. Uh, in one hadith, for example, from uh, Imam Zain al-Abidin, he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. He says, Man ahya hadhihi al-layla lam yamut qalbahu yawma tamutu fihi al-qulub. Whoever stays up on this night in worship of Allah, his or her heart will not die on the day when hearts will die. So uh, it is highly recommended for those who may be tired, who've had a long day at work, who have to go to work tomorrow. It may be just waking up a little earlier tomorrow morning and showing some sincerity to Allah and saying, I was not able to stay up all night, but I still wish to be one of those who benefit. So in other words, let, the, let not this night and tomorrow's day pass like another ordinary night and day. And as you know, Thursday nights are also recommended for staying up in worship. So this is a very, very unique year because we're getting the 15th night of Sha'ban on a Thursday night, on Laylatul Ibadah anyway. 
And then Friday itself has its own importance because it is the day when the Imam is born. It is also the day when the Imam is supposed to return because in the ziyarah that we recite of the Imam on Friday, we say, وَهَذَا يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ وَهُوَ يَوْمُ الْمُتَوَقَّعُ فِيهِ ظُهُورَكِ This is Friday, the day in which we expect your return. So tomorrow, the 15th of Sha'ban, which is his birth, also happens to be the day he returns and also happens to be the day of his birth. And so therefore, this night and this day is just immersed and soaked with blessings. I am certain that this night Allah is showering His mercy and love on the earth for whoever is willing to take and drink from it. So let it not be an ordinary night inshallah my dear brothers and sisters. There is also a lot of recommendation to remember Aba Abdullah al Hussein on this night because there is a very close affinity as well between the Imam of our time and Imam Hussein alayhi salam and it is a lengthy discussion on how the two personalities are very very close but uh, you may have heard this from other ulama. We know, for example, again from uh, Mafatihul Janan of Sheikh Abbas Qummi, that says, Whosoever wishes to be in the presence of 124,000 prophets, Anbiya, meaning all the Anbiya, or in other words, if you wish to rub shoulders with all the Anbiya from Adam to Khatam, then you should go for the ziyarat of Hussein and be in Karbala on a night such as this. And of course we pray to Allah that inshallah we all have an opportunity once in our lifetime to be in Karbala on a night such as this inshallah. Ameen ya Rabbal Alameen. And just to show us again that on a night such as this let us not worship Allah as a ritual or as a habit or simply with the chatter of the mind but let us silence the mind and open our hearts and show uh, 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 Allah how much we wish to come towards him with complete surrender. We see that in the amal as well, there is a, a mention of things that hint at this. As an example, Sheikh Abbas Qummi says that if you cannot go for the ziyarat of Hussein, at the very least, he says, go out to the open sky. He says, go to the rooftop of your houses, which is obviously from the perspective of the Middle East, uh, which we don't have here. But essentially he says, go out under the open sky. Then he says, look towards the heavens. This is at the very least, he says. Look towards the heavens, look towards the right, look towards the left. In other words, gaze at the sky for a bit. And he says, if nothing else, then look towards the heavens, look up towards the heavens and say, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Peace be on you, O Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He says, even these two lines should not escape you. Look towards the heaven. Now, here, to me, this has a certain meaning. The meaning is that it is easy to simply stand and read a long ziyarah. And there is a particular ziyarah for Imam Hussein that, inshallah, we shall recite tonight. But what is the idea behind look towards the stars and look towards the right and look towards the left? The idea is that say this with your heart because... If you stand out in the open and you look towards the heavens and you gaze to the right and the left for a bit, you will find not only will the world around you become silent, but the mind will be silent as well. The chatter will disappear. There will be a certain peace and tranquility. So he is inviting us that bring a certain composure, a certain tranquility to yourself. And then when there is no ego, when there is no mind, when there is just the real self, then connect with Karbala and say, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Peace be on you, O Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka wa rahmatullah. And it is with these two lines that, inshallah, he will reply you from Karbala, inshallah. So let this not escape us, inshallah, on a great night such as this. Sheikh Abbas Kumi as well uh, says that it is highly recommended to pray Salat uh, Ja'far al Tayyar, which is the Salat which the Prophet of Islam. Uh, taught uh, Ja'far, the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he returned from Abyssinia and he gave it to him as a gift. So there are many, many amals to perform. It is also highly recommended to fast on uh, uh, the 15th of Sha'ban, which is tomorrow. So in whatever capacity and in whatever way we are able to do this, inshallah, let it not uh, escape us and let this be a special occasion where we pray for ourselves, our families, our loved ones, and also we pray for each other, uh, and we pray for our communities that inshallah we may thrive and we may continue to work towards our own uh, uh, purity in preparation for the 
return of the Imam, insha'Allah, if you can recite Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I have uh, five minutes still, and uh, um, I just will share one or two ahadith from the ones that I wanted to earlier. And uh, thereafter, inshallah, we, we uh, have a mawlud and some announcements before uh, salat as well. Uh, these ahadith may appear somewhat uh, depressing, but they are not depressing actually. They are inspiring if we look at them in the right light, because we've all heard of the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So when certain things are said, they may appear uh, as if we are to lose hope, but actually we are to gain hope and, and, and pull up our socks, if you like, and really rise to the occasion. We have one hadith. Uh, from the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, he says to his companions, uh, you are my companions, but my brothers will come towards the end of the times. They shall believe, without, they shall believe in me without having seen me. It will be harder for them to hold on to their faith than to hold a burning piece of coal. Okay. Um, I'm not reading them in Arabic in the interest of time. Uh, although they are very beautiful when read in Arabic. He says, there shall come a time on people after you, the Prophet says to his companions. He says, there, there will come a time on people after you. One man amongst them shall have greater reward than 50 of you. They said to him, Messenger of God, we were with you at the battle of Badr and Uhud and Hunayn, and the Quran was revealed amongst us. How could there be anyone greater than us? He said to them, if you had to bear what they shall bear, you would not have the patience that they shall have. And he explains this in another tradition. He says to his companions, there shall come a time when the heart of a believer will melt like salt melts in water, because he shall see sin and wrong being committed around him, all around him, but he will feel helpless, unable to do anything about it. And the believer shall walk amongst people in fear. If he speaks the truth, they will eat him up. In other words, they will just be all over him. And if he keeps quiet, then the anger and the, the, the anguish will consume him from within. And Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam alayhi says, He says, I swear by Allah, you will be saved. Mankind has no option except that they will be tried, and they will be tested, and they will be sieved until many of you will fall out from the sieve, and they shall not remain of you except very few. And he says in another tradition, I swear by Allah, that for which you have stretched your necks, and that for which you are waiting eagerly, will not come until many of you have lost hope in his return. And he says in another tradition, this is from his father Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Muhammad. If people knew what the Qa'im shall do when he returns, then most of them would wish they never saw him. And I will leave that to our imagination. Um, but Imam Ali alayhi salam tells us, awaiting for the return of the Mahdi, intidhar al-Faraj, should not be something that you lose hope in. Never lose hope in the return of your Imam. And never lose hope that Allah will look to you with mercy. For the best of all actions and the best of all a'mals is intidhar al-faraj. Is waiting for this relief and for this Imam to return. So, um, there are many other traditions here that I will not uh, narrate. Uh, uh, but just to conclude this, we wish to say that in preparing for our Imam, there are many things we can do. But first and foremost is to purify ourselves. This purification can happen not just by reflection, but by looking at how we lead our lives. One very, very important thing is our source of living and our earning. Because many of the ahadith which I have not narrated here that I was going to, is related around this issue that... Uh, people will fail or people will pollute themselves because of earning a living that is unlawful. Or there will come a time when it will be impossible to earn a halal living. And there are incidents as well that you know, are in the books to say that the people who are 
who met the Imam after doing lots and lots of amals and ascetic practices and practicing occult sciences and ilmul jafr and numerology and all, when they finally met the Imam, the Imam showed them this message again and again, that if you purify your livelihood, if you make your living pure, if you're careful of what you eat and what you feed your children, if you carefully look at where your money is coming from, because we think of halal and haram food only as the food itself is the meat halal, but we don't sometimes think of where the money is coming that is purchasing that halal meat. And the message from the Imam time and again is that if we keep this at the forefront of our minds, that what the food that goes into our body should be halal because that goes into our blood system, that affects our thoughts and that affects our hearts, then that is very, very uh, uh, significant that we should look towards this insha'Allah. Um, on a night such as this, um, I will be ending with a short dua which is from the Imam himself, a dua that we recite in the month of Ramadan, in dua al-iftitah. And in these uh, uh, words, we will be complaining to Allah for the absence of our Imam and asking him to return the Imam as soon as possible. And uh, before we do that, we wish to send our greetings on this auspicious and blessed night, first and foremost, to Rasulullah himself, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And then, of course, to all the Imams. And it is important, again, I cannot stress enough, to realize the importance and how lucky we are to be the followers of this Imam. Because Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلُّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On the day of judgment, we shall call every nation with their Imam. We are going to be called, if we are true and faithful to this Imam, we shall be raised with an Imam who is unique and unparalleled in many, many ways such that the other Imams used to long for him and say that if we lived in his times, we would come to his help. And if you think of Allah's relationship with human beings from the time human beings walked on this planet, the very first proof of God was Adam. All the prophets, all the messengers, all the Imams, he is the final proof. He is the inheritor and the warith of all the previous proofs of God. So for us to be blessed to be in his uh, uh, amongst his followers and to be of his Shia and to have that faith to believe in him despite not having seen him is a great, great mercy of Allah something that we should treasure and hold as precious and we should teach our children to keep that love alive and inshallah remain with it and we also pray to our Imam as well that he should also beseech Allah that his return should hasten and of all the communities of Shias, inshallah, may he choose us to be of those who come to his aid. And may he choose us to be of those who follow him, inshallah. And may we be true, inshallah, to him, so that on the day we see him, not only is, are we overjoyed to see him, but he is overjoyed to see us, inshallah. And we pray to Allah, inshallah, that if he returns in our lifetime, we may be blessed with martyrdom, so that we may roll in our blood for his sake, inshallah. And if we were to die before he returns, inshallah, on a night like this, we should pray that Allah makes us of those who are raised from their graves to help the imam. And we pray also to the imam, inshallah, that before we die, if his return is to come after our lives, then at least we may be blessed with a vision of him once in our lifetime, so that that may give us solace and comfort that we are of those that he is pleased with, inshallah, and that he is proud to call amongst his Shia, inshallah. So we end with this dua uh, from dua al-iftitah, which is also from uh, Imam Sahib al-Zaman, alayhi salam, and we ask Allah and complain to him. اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله. Oh Allah, we complain to you the absence of our Prophet. Your blessings be on him and his family. وغيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا. We complain to you, O oh Allah, of the concealment of our leader and the abundance of our enemies. وقلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا. We complain to you, O oh Allah, of the scarcity of our numbers and the severity of our trials. وَتَذَاهُرِ الزَّمَانِ عَلَيْنَا And we complain to you, O oh Allah, of the victory of the era against us. فَصَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ O oh Allah, send your blessings on Muhammad and his family. وَعِنَّا عَلَى ذَلِكَ بِفَتْهِمْ مِنْكَ تُعَجِّلُهُ And help us overcome that by granting us an immediate victory. وَبِذُرٍ تَكْشِفُهُ وَنَصْرٍ تُعِزُّهُ وَسُلْطَانٍ حَقٍّ تُظْهِرُهُ 
and grant us an immediate victory dispersing miseries give us a help that strengthens providing us with an authority of truth which you manifest wa rahmatin minka tujallilunaha wa afiyatin minka tulbisunaha a mercy from you which is clear to us and a well-being from you which clothes us bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin we ask you by your mercy O most merciful ameen ya rabbal alamin O oh Allah, we ask you sincerely on this night that you hasten the return of our Imam. O oh Allah, bihaqqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, we ask you that through him and through his blessings you fill our homes with barakah. And O oh Allah, bihaqqi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, we ask you for the courage to earn a lawful livelihood. We ask you, O oh Allah, to cloth with health those who are ill and maghfira for those who have passed away. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'ul alim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima.